Hello and welcome to another episode of the V8 Supercars Fancast. My name is Kendall. I will be your host as always. Uh, first of all, let me say sorry that this one's a little bit late. Um, sometimes life just catches up to you. Uh, but that's okay. I'm here now. And if for whatever reason you were hanging out for this one, um, here it is. Um, but if you were going to skip an episode, uh, this wouldn't be a terrible one to skip because not a hell of a lot happened at Phillip Island. Um, that's really super worth talking about. There was, yeah, it was definitely some strange, it's definitely a strange Saturday race. That's for sure. I've got a few things I'd like to say about that, but, um, otherwise, uh, in terms of championships and things like that, not a huge amount, not a huge amount happened over the weekend but that's okay that's okay not every race has to be a world beater and it still gave us plenty to talk about as you can probably tell by looking at the length of this video so let's get right into it Phillip Island a classic track um quite a few things were different this year versus last year um first of all they were trialing a new rule um, so I was wrong uh, last week. I said that they were they were implementing Park Ferme as a rule. I was wrong about that. Um, it's actually a trial. So they only did it at Simmons Plains. Um, and they will be doing it later on at Ipswich or Queensland Raceway, if that's how you better identify with it, the paperclip. They'll be doing it again. But at this track, they weren't using Park Ferme. Um, so I was wrong about that. Sorry if that was misleading. Um, but, you know... We all make mistakes, um, so hopefully that didn't throw you off too badly. Um, but this week, a new rule was trialed, and that was closing pit lane um, when a safety car comes out. And I don't have a problem with this one. Um, there was a safety car on Sunday, or was it Saturday? Maybe it was just Saturday. I think it was Saturday. Yeah, there was a safety car on Saturday. Um... And yeah, no one went into pit lane. And I'm okay with this because um, it's supercars. We've always had a problem with um, safety in the pit lane when it comes to multiple cars. Uh, things like stacking, trying to fit cars in there. Um, when it comes to fitting new tires and things like that. Um, because track position isn't as important as having a fresh set of tires. Um, everyone goes into pit lane even if they have to stack. So... You end up with a horribly congested pit lane and people just physically can't leave their stall because there's cars stacked in front of them. Um, you get incidents like what happened at Adelaide this year where Mostert um, spins uh, spins Kelly around because he's just he's just left straight. He's been told to leave and you just run straight into him. Um, or you get incidents like last year at Newcastle where uh, Craig completely mounted, I think it was Scott Pye's car, and broke his, uh, his suspension... Um, just because the pit lane was squishy, it's just tight and narrow. Um, I was I was okay with this. It does take away a huge dimension of strategy, um, which sucks. Um, it's not the ideal solution closing the pit lane. Um, ideally, I'd like the pit lane to only be closed at places where pit lane just can't support double stacking. Uh, Phillip Island is quite narrow, um, so I'm perfectly okay with them not doing it there it's also surrounded by fences and things like there's not a much le there's not much leeway at phillip island um and um i was perfectly okay with them doing it here and other tracks where the pit lane is wider um i don't want to see it as a blanket ban for the season um because if if a pit lane can accommodate it then why not let them do that you know um but um I think the rule went all right. Um, it's pretty hard to see what difference this kind of rule makes um, without, I guess, simulating the race <laughs> and then having everybody pit and see what happens. Um, it's pretty hard to see because you can only really guess what the race would have been like had that rule not been in place. Um, I think, but overall, I think definitely for the tracks with the narrower pit lanes, I think this is overall a good thing to be doing um because it just prevents silly incidents and it's unsafe it's just unsafe like there's people all through pit lane if you've got heaps of cars trying to get in and out as fast as possible with people everywhere 
Well, that's when bad things happen, you know. Um, so overall, I don't, I don't think I'm not opposed to it at all. Um, I do hope it's only really used at um, at uh, places where pit lane is quite narrow. Um, don't really see the need for it otherwise, um, and I feel like it would take away a dimension of the racing that uh, that we do get a lot in supercars, which is one of the best parts about it when everyone dives into pit lane due to a safety car um, because we do get some of the most dramatic parts of a race happening in pit lane because of that. But it is a safety thing, um, and I'm not opposed to it at tracks like Phillip Island where the pit lane is quite narrow. Um, that being said, there are other alternatives, maybe, um, and one of those alternatives is just to extend the amount of garages that can be used. So... Um, in supercars, there's two cars to a garage, two cars to a pit bay, which means that they have to double stack if they both come in at the same time. Um, at places like Phillip Island, there's plenty more garages they can use. So why can't they just use these other garages? Um, well, um, not every pit lane in supercars can support, um, what is it? 25 cars, 24 cars worth of garages, uh, one individually. Um, so you'd, there'd be so many questions about if you can, if there's, say there's only 20 garages, who are the four people that have to double stack? You know, how do you sort that out? Or do you just can the whole thing altogether? Which means that only very certain tracks will be allowed to do that, will be able to do that because they have, they have other tracks simply can't accommodate, um, that amount of, um, uh, garages. Um, the other thing is that it would it would essentially double the pit crew size um, because um, you would probably need to get um, what, one pit crew for each car instead of having one pit crew for two cars. So it would effectively double the pit crew. And the pit crew is what? A spike man, a fuel man, and one person on each tyre. So that's six people. So that's six more employees that every team needs to employ full time, basically. Um, and it just it just raises costs. Um, supercars is competitive. <laughs> Maybe not so much at the moment, but supercars is competitive overall because costs are low and it doesn't take much for a team to uh, fund its way back up to the top um, or fund its way to the top initially. Um money isn't so much the object as it is just clever engineering, which is good. Um, and this would increase costs, basically. Um, even if you put the garage bays like right next to each other, um, you still would need more pit crew. Because um, otherwise, I mean, the bigger teams will just have individual pit crews, so that way they can bring both cars in at the same time and not lose any time. Um, and... Um, smaller teams would just be would just be screwed <laughs> so and no, that's not very sporting um i don't think there's anything wrong with the system that currently is implemented it means that teams actually have to think about when they're going to pit both cars um it means drivers can vie for track position it adds an extra dimension to things and to what is in reality kind of a mundane affair pit stops like let's be honest you're just changing tires and putting fuel in it's not that exciting inherently um, but the extra dimension that's added to it about having to share a bay with someone else, um, safety cars, when to do it, you know, when to do the undercut, when to do the overcut, all that sort of stuff makes them interesting. Um, and turning all the cars down, putting all the cars into their own individual pit bay, at the very least removes the element of needing to be in front of your teammate so that you get priority in a situation like that, um, which would remove... Um, some strategy for the teams and it would also make it less exciting for us to watch because teammates no longer need to fight for that extra position so that they have priority in pit stops because it doesn't matter. Um, so that was the new rule they were trialing at Phillip Island. Um, I think it went fine, you know. Um, I think, it, like I said, at Phillip Island, uh, pit lane's pretty narrow um, and it's probably good to have a rule like this at tracks where pit lane is very narrow. Um, but... The race. How was the race? Or, the well, the Saturday qualifying. So let's start with qualifying. Um, knockout was used once again, and I don't really understand why. Um, I feel like, I think we've, I think they've decided to put knockout qualifying on all the super sprint races. Um, 
regardless of how long they are. So last year they were put, they were used on tracks that are short. So Simmons Plains is a less than one minute lap. So having, uh, getting rid of the cars on the tracks and not having 24 cars on track all at once is a good thing um, because it frees up space on a track that there isn't much space on. Um, but uh, Phillip Islanders is a minute and a half. It's a decent length track. It's not short. Um, so I really don't see the point of knockout qualifying, especially, again, like I said last week, and I'm going to keep saying this, um, if practice, if the third practice session before qualifying is going to be used as a pseudo-qualifying anyway, with all cars on track at the same time, you might as well just do that in qualifying, you know? Um, because the practice, uh, as you probably know, the top 10 from practice make it into qualifying too automatically, which makes practice... A qualifying session except all the cars are on the track so you know have knockout qualifying and also remove some of the cars from the track in those knockout sessions but there is going to be a point where you have to have all the tracks on all the cars on track at once to do a q1 performance and at the moment practice is q1 it's like q0.5 um it's not a very elegant solution i really wish that q1 was just longer um, or maybe split into two chunks where you draw lots and cars go out. I've talked about this last week. I don't want to go into it again. Um, but basically, I think the current system is weird <laughs> and that it's not very elegant. And it turns practice into a qualifying session, which is not what practice is for. And it isn't fair to the teams that are still working out their cars balance. Um, that they have to essentially also qualify in that session. Um, because it's so many advantages. You save on tires, you know? Um, and it takes you, it gets you instantly into the top 14. Like, that's so many advantages to have. Of course, they're going to shoot for it. Um, it just doesn't seem very fair to me. Um, and it's just not interesting. I, I don't want to tune into practice just to see. I don't want to have to tune into practice just to see the, who makes it to Q2 automatically. Um, everyone should be on track for Q1. You know, some kind of system has to be in place because at the moment it doesn't really solve the problem because everyone's on track for practice anyway and it's being treated as a qualifying session anyway so it doesn't solve that problem um and it also turns practice into a qualifying session which is not what practice is for so it just creates a new problem but you know whatever i'm done talking about that i'm not talking about it anymore <laughs> i'm not gonna bring it up again um so yeah phillip island is a sort of average size circuit minute and a half lap uh roughly and uh, so, yeah, um, we'll go through the qualifying results, starting with Scott McLaughlin in pole position, his, I think, seventh consecutive Phillip Island pole position. He's absolutely mad about the track. Um, for 1 minute 29.2. Now, that, that lap is significant because Fabian Coulthard, uh, with a front row lockout for DJR, um, is in second and that's not bad um what makes that significant is that he had a 129.8 so scott mclaughlin had a 129.2 fabian had a 129.8 six tenths slower six tenths over half a second slower that's ludicrous absolutely insane that difference and that's not that's sort of reflected all the way through the field. Normally, um, when I talk about the difference in qualifying, it's about a second from first to last. It's about a second in lap time. Um, I don't know what DJR have done, and in particular Scott McLaughlin, but the difference between first and last now in Phillip Island is 2.7 seconds. <laughs> that's that's uh, that's an extra second almost uh, than it usually is and it's not like this is a new it's not like it's been like this all year this is this is how it is um at this race just at this race it wasn't like this last race the times were as close as they usually are ra last race um and the gap between fabian coulthard and Chaz moster um who Chaz qualified in third is three temps so even that is a huge gap that we don't normally see in supercars. Um, and the gap from Chaz to Scott is eight temps, almost nine temps down. It's ridiculously high. 
It's ludicrous. The the gap that we normally see from first to last is exceeded from first to tenth. <laughs> If you take out Scotty and Fabian, the times return to normal, basically. So if Chaz is in first and you remove the DJR cars entirely from the picture, um, the top time would be at 130.1. And the slowest time would be at 131.9. So that's about a second, almost two seconds. So about 1.8-ish seconds. That's a lot more closer to what we're used to seeing. Um, That's way closer to what we're used to seeing. So, I don't know what DJR have done at Phillip Island, but they, those cars were light years ahead of everybody else. Absolutely head and shoulders above the rest of the field. Um, and I said we didn't have much to talk about because, um, spoilers, DJR did basically just dominate the weekend. Um, and that's why there's not a huge amount to talk about. But there is a lot of speculating to be done about where this speed has come from. This is like, the Red Bull days. Um, this is like the tri- the Triple Eight um, in their heyday. Um, it's r- ridiculous. Like no one else has a chance, sort of thing. Um, so I hope it doesn't stay this way. Um, it's getting to the point where um, Scotty is really running away with the championship, and I really don't want to call it this early. <laughs> um, but I do believe that Scotty has probably got this one this year. Um, if anyone can challenge him, it'll be Fabian. And I really hope he does because if DJR is this dominant and Fabian is in his distant second like he was last year, we are going to be in for a not so exciting year. <laughs> so I really hope Fabian steps it up and really shows um, shows us what he can do. Because he's a good driver. He's proven that before. And, um, you know, I've kind of said some things about how I don't think he can cut it anymore. And I still kind of believe that's true. But hopefully he steps his game up this year. And just, just to give us something interesting to watch. Because a battle between Fabian and Scotty would be nice, to say the least. Um, but I'll continue with the rest of the times. Uh, Chaz Moster in third. Um with a 1 minute 30.3. Andre Heimgartner in 4th. I think this is the first top 10 appearance by a Nissan at all. And he made it into 4th. Um, excellent qualifying for him. He started in Q1 as well. He didn't make it to Q2 automatically. Um, so he put in the hard uh, hard effort to get into, um, into Q3. And he did a great job. And he had a great race too. Um, people haven't really been talking about Heimgartner and I don't really know why he did a great job but um, I'll talk about that in the race uh, Will Davison in 5th he's always there or thereabouts isn't he uh, I feel bad for Will Davison if he had some better luck um, and if DJR weren't as dominant I feel like he'd be a championship contender um, but that's the story for a lot of the Tickford boys isn't it um, Rick Kelly in 6 another Nissan in the top 10 another great drive from Rick Kelly um, he did really well um, on Saturday uh, Cameron Waters in 7th speaking of the Tickford boys not having any luck um, this is a boy that doesn't seem to have any luck um, he could very much be at the top of the field had he had a better start to the season these things happen though um, good qualifying from him in 7th Scott Pye in 8th the first of the Holdens um, he had a great qualifying session another one that started in Q1 um, he just put in the times it was pretty good to see um, and right behind him, Shane Van Gisbergen in ninth place. 1.3 seconds off the pace. Uh, it's not often we see a Red Bull this far down, um, or even a HRT car this far down. Um, but there it is, and he's the highest qualified. So, um, yeah, Red Bull didn't have a good weekend at all, um, which is annoying because they're sort of the main rivals at this point um i think they're still second in the champ in the constructors championship but it'd be a close thing was with, with two of the tickford teams um yeah i mean red bull didn't have a good start to the year last year either um shane took adelaide in a clean sleep but after that they completely disappeared off the map in a very similar way to what's happening right now um i think even philip Island last year for them was horrendous too so from memory, uh, I think that's when Shane lost his power steering and had to manhandle his, that car away around the circuit last year. Um, 
I don't know what it is about Phillip Island and and uh, and Red Bull. They just don't seem to be able to do it. But um, you know, I do hope that Red Bull pull it back up. Um, as much as they are the top team, um, not underdogs at all. Um, we need competition at the front, you know. So if it's not Red Bull, I want like t- Tickford. They are almost there, but not quite. <laughs> I wish they did sort of. The Mustang is clearly strong, but Tickford just haven't been able to capitalize on it in the same way that DJR have. And the Nissans have been nowhere except for this weekend. So um, I would like to see Red Bull, one of the other Holden teams doing well. Erebus could pick up the pieces, but they've had a bad start to the year. Um, Walkinshaw and Dreddy haven't had a good start of the year. Um, like, yeah, and they're the strongest of the Holden teams, really. So anyway... Um. Yeah, I just I, we more competition at the front, please. <laughs> um, tenth place after Shane Todd Hazelwood, another good qualifying performance from him. He's really piquing my interest this year. Um, talented kid. Um, in maybe not the best car. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, if he continue if he can continue being this consistent, I'll uh, be continually impressed with him because he's been good. He's been good. Um, Lee Holdsworth in 11th, um, as always, the last of the Tickford Mustangs. Um, Yeah, I don't know what to say about Holdsworth other than... um, Yeah, I don't know what to say. (laughs) I really don't. I I think it's a shame that Caruso is gone and Holdsworth is in Tickford. Let's just put it that way. Um, I think it's a real shame that um, Jacobson replaced Caruso because Caruso was good. Um, and I don't think he put a foot wrong and uh, here he is off the field and someone like Lee Holdsworth who hasn't been able to capitalize on the car that he's in at all um, who's in a fast car the Mustangs are good and he's consistently the worst of them um, I don't know I said last year that I, I, I didn't think he was he was good enough and this is kind of proving my point um, I would like him to pick it up I want to always be proven wrong. I want every driver to be fantastic so we can always get great racing. Um, so hopefully he's just trying to settle into that car. But it's been 11 races now. 10 races now. Um, and, you know, settle is a point where you can't use settling in as an excuse. So it is his first season in a Ford ever, um, I'm pretty sure. And it is also, um, yeah, he's just made a big team switch. So I'll give him... The benefit of the doubt for a couple more rounds, but, you know, otherwise the hammer's coming down on him from me, <laughs> as much as he's probably afraid of that, obviously. Uh, David Reynolds in 12th and Anton Di Pasquale in 13th. Erebus not not doing great, which is unfortunate because they were so close last year. Um, I'd like to see I'd like to see Erebus back up at the front, to be honest, um, more consistently. Uh, Nick Perker and Tim Slade for BJR in 14th and 15th. BJR probably had the best start of the season out of any of the Holdens, to be honest. <laughs> um, it's disappointing to see see them both down the back of the field now. I think they were pretty good drivers. I don't think they're world beaters, but um, don't really know what's happening with the Holdens. They're clearly sliding down the field at Phillip Island, so hopefully things get turned around. Uh, Mark Winterbottom in 16th. Uh, last race is pole sitter in 16th. So things have really gone all over the place since last race, that's for sure. Uh, Jamie Winkup in 17th. Um, his car was dire. Um, and that's not me like trying to stick up for Jamie. That's me looking at an onboard um, during the weekend and seeing how much oversteer he had. He was absolutely fighting that car around. Um I think he even said that that's the worst car that he's driven since he was in Tasman Motorsport in like 2003, you know. So that's that's not great. Um, Red Bull really need to work out what's going on. You know, it's not good enough for a team of their caliber. Uh, James Courtney in 18th. He had an awful qualifying session. He really did. Um, he didn't have a great weekend. Not really his fault, though, most of the weekend. But... Um, yeah, we'll talk about him in a little bit. Richie Stanaway in 19th. Gary Jacobson in 20th. Simona Di Silvestro, who I'm pretty sure lives in 21st position, in 21st. Jack LeBrock in 22nd. Macaulay Jones in 23rd. And James Golding in 24th. Um, and his timed lap is showing it took him five minutes to go around. Not really sure what that's about, but um, <laughs> he started in last. That's the most important thing. As for the race, the race on Saturday was weird as hell. Um, first, I'm pretty sure James Courtney lost a wheel 
um, his load bearing wheel just sort of exploded, <laughs> which was pretty weird. Um, he went into the pits and got it sorted, and he he, made, he finished the race, but um, obviously that's not his fault that his wheel exploded. But not a great weekend for him. Um, Jamie Winkup's wheel fell off his car after a, a pit stop gone awry, um, as well. And Mark Winterbottom's wheel also fell off his car. So we had three wheel-related incidents um, in one race, which was really weird. I've never seen that before. Um, and something needs to be done about the wheels um, because they keep falling off cars. And um, yeah, I know they get fined um, and championship points deducted and all that stuff, which is fine. Um, but... Having a wheel roll off a car is dangerous. Um, I know it, on on TV it doesn't look that severe because it's just ah oh, it's just a little wheel rolling around. Um, but those things weigh like twenty kilos, um, and they're rolling around when they come off the car. They're rolling at whatever speed the car was going at. So if that car's driving at two hundred kilometers an hour and the wheel falls off, you've got a wheel, a 20, 20 kilo object rolling around free at 200 kilometers an hour um and if it if it goes over a barricade into a into a spectator area you're going to get some serious serious injuries um it's just it's alarming because it keeps happening um i know in open wheel races they use um a, a material to hold the string in, uh, to hold the wheel in place so it's kind of like a bungee cord um and if the wheel falls off the car it just sort of stays attached via this elastic cord thing um i don't think they should i don't really know how that would work in um in supercars but i, I feel like something sh similar should happen or something because the wheels keep falling off you know like it happened at melbourne um it happened at bathurst last year especially to red bull for some reason they got real issues with keeping their wheels on their cars um like the amount of the amount of wheels that have fallen off recently has been ridiculous, and they are very dangerous. You know, like we're lucky nothing bad has happened, but it very easily could. Um, so maybe a sensor to check if the wheel is on properly. I don't know. I have no idea, but um, something needs to be done because the wheels just rolling around all over the place is not a good look. Not a good look. Um, aside from all that weirdness, though, um, so Jamie Winkup stopped on the road after his wheel came off we got a safety car like i said the pit lane closed um this time around so safety car didn't really uh, didn't really change the race much apart from piling everyone back together um and then we got a race to the end um after that so nothing really incredible happened apart from the wheels falling off uh as for the running order scott mclaughlin in first place are you really surprised followed by fabian coulthard again another lockout for them uh, good job, good race. Obviously, they're incredibly dominant, um, but no one could touch them this weekend. They've, their car is just so much faster right now, especially at Phillip Island. We'll see if they continue that pace into the next round. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully some people catch back up to them, but you never know. Um, Andre Heimgartner with his first non-co-driver endurance racing podium. Great job from him. He had an excellent drive. He really did. He, um, he, held, off, he held off some tough... Um, some tough competitors behind him and he managed to come out on top and secure a podium for Nissan, the first one of the year and the first one since I want to say Winton last year it might be wrong though um, but excellent drive excellent drive from him really happy for him um, remember it's only his second year in supercars and he, he is another guy that I've got my eye on you know he's um, he's talented he's a talented guy so we'll see where he goes in the future uh, David Reynolds up eight spots to fourth. He had a great race as well. I don't even really know what happened. He just kind of like, they just kind of like did their strategy right, um, and he managed to make up a lot of spots. Uh, good job from him. Chaz Moster in fifth. Bit of a quiet race for him. And Shane Van Gisbergen in sixth. Up another up three spots. Um, he was not strong in that car at all, but he managed to hold on for six. Um, Rick Kelly in seventh. Scott Pine eighth. Nick Perkat up five spots to to ninth. Good job to him. Will Davison in 10th. Todd Hazelwood in 11th. Anton Di Pasquale in 12th. James Golding up 11 spots into 13th. I don't even remember that happening. Um, I don't remember how he did that. I think that was just clever strategy from Gary Rogers. But uh, Richie Stanaway also up 5 spots into 14th. Um, 
good drive from the both of them. Uh, at the expense of Lee Holdsworth, who finished in 15th. Simona in 16th. She had a quiet race as well. I didn't notice that she'd got up so many so many spots. Um, she went up five spots into 16th. Tim Slade in 17th. Macaulay Jones also up five spots into 18th. Uh, Gary Jacobson in 19th. Jack LeBrock in 20th. Mark Winterbottom with his wheel problems in 21st. James Courtney with his also wheel problems in 22nd. Um, Cameron Waters not classified for an incident with Shane Van Gisbergen and Jamie Winkup not classified for his wheel coming off and they retired the car after 11 laps. Um, yeah, the Cameron Waters thing. Um, they were having a battle with... Uh, Cameron Waters was behind Rick Kelly. Um, they're coming out from... Oh, was it turn four? The sharp right, the first sharp right-hander, anyway. Um, they were coming out from there. Cameron got a bit of a run on Rick. And Rick blocked him, which allowed Shane to come up around the inside of Cameron and put himself on the outside of the next corner, which is a left-hander. Um, while they're all jostling for position, uh, a little bit of contact happens. Cameron uh, Waters goes up. The rides uh, rides up uh, Shane's wheel. Um, and breaks his suspension. Shane's car is fine, and Waters has to retire. Um, to me, it was 100% a racing incident. Um, Cameron... I keep calling him Cameron. I shouldn't use first names all the time, but uh, Waters left him um, no room whatsoever, um, and um, Shane looked like he put his wheel onto the grass. Maybe? Um... Or he just got pinched by Waters and um, and yeah, it just broke Waters' car. Um, so either Shane got put up on the grass and he created a little bit of oversteer um, and went into the side of went kind of into the side or pushed him closer to, to Waters and then Waters ran into him or um, or Waters just straight up pinched him too hard and ran into him. Um, to me, it looked like he pinched him um, and he just didn't realize how much room um, Gisbergen didn't have, you know, um, that's what it looked like to me, uh, regardless, it, it, 100%, it was, uh, there was no penalty given, it was a racing incident, um, and this is 100% what I agree with, um, it didn't deserve to be anything more than that, you know, it just looked like a complete racing incident to me, um, uh, unfortunate for Waters, because he was in good position, but that's just the way that happens with close racing like that. Also on the Saturday race, uh, Scott McLaughlin and Fabian Coulter both were penalised for... What is this? What was it called? Um, what are they called? Line lockers. That's what they're called. Um, so after, um, after the race in New Zealand last year where the Shane had that... Let's call it controversial moment with the wheel spinning um, that cost him. But you could probably argue the championship. Um, uh, Supercars has since installed on all cars an automatic system to prevent the wheels from spinning. Um, this system was not engaged during um, either of the DJR cars pit stops. And the reason why they uh, weren't engaged is because both cars stalled during the pit stop, turning off the electronics um, which turned off the pit stop line locker. Um, they were penalised for this, but they weren't. Their drivers weren't penalised because it's not a driver thing; it's a team thing. So they lost thirty team points um, each, I think, um, and three thousand dollars per car in a fine. Not a big deal. Um, but if you're wondering why they were talking about um, wheel spinning um, issues then that's the explanation to that one. Um, but yeah, not exactly a thrilling race on Saturday, aside from all the weirdness with the wheels falling off um, and a great drive from Hungarten to get a podium. Uh, wasn't a huge amount of report on, just a very ominous sign for the rest of the season from DJR, very ominous. Um, but great job to Hungarten. He did, he did an excellent race, an excellent race. Um, so let's move on to Amaral qualifying for race 10 or the Sunday race with guess who's in first it's Scott McLaughlin not, a, not surprised at all um, Fabian Coulthard in second another six temps down on Scotty's time um, the rest of the field behind Fabian were much closer um, Chas Mostert was in third once again um, just one tenth back 
Um, it's ridiculous how fast Scotty got his car, how fast McLaughlin's car was. It's just, it's ludicrous. Absolutely ridiculous. Six times is not a time difference I've seen between two cars in supercars in a long time. You know, so, um, like I said, ominous sign for the rest of the season. Hopefully, um, things aren't that, the gap isn't that big come other, other races. But six temps on a track that's only a minute and a half long is, is ridiculously, ridiculously big. That's incredible amount of time he's finding. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Um, but um, Fabian Coulthard in second, Chas Moster in third, Anton Di Pasquale in fourth. Excellent qualifying from him. Uh, Cameron Waters in fifth, Will Davison in sixth, Shane Van Gisbergen in seventh, one second down. So he did better than yesterday. Yesterday? Saturday. Uh, Todd Hazelwood in eighth, another strong qualifying for him. He's doing pretty well in qualifying. He's been quite consistent. I think it's just that race pace that lets him down a little bit. Perhaps the inexperience of the team in terms of strategy is uh, maybe something else that means he doesn't get great positions in the race. Uh, James Courtney in ninth, completely swapped with Scott Pye. Um, so good to see one of those cars up there in the top 10. Um, and Jamie Winkup in 10th, just making it into the top 10. Um, Rick Kelly in 11th. So the Nissan's not doing as good. Um, not bad though, better than they have been this year. Uh, but, you know, not in the top 10 and definitely not in 4th. Uh, Nick Perkett in 12th, Andre Heimgartner in 13th, James Golding in 14th, Scott Pye in 15th, David Reynolds of a pretty shockifying, <laughs> pretty shocking qualifying performance in 16th, Richie Stanaway in 17th, Lee Holdsworth in 18th, absolutely nowhere in qualifying, uh, Mark Winterbottom in 19th, Tim Slade in 20th, the BJR cars really struggling this um, during this weekend. Uh, Gary Jacobson in 21st, Macaulay Jones in 22nd, Simona de Silvestro in 23rd, and Jack LeBrock in 24th place. This time, the gap from first to last was 2.2 seconds instead of the uh, slightly ridiculous 2.7 seconds. Um, but it's still a much bigger gap than we are used to seeing in this sport, that's for sure. So if you're curious, um, the one and a half second mark was passed um, at 13th place. So... That's normally the gap we see between the whole field, and this time we saw it at from 1st to uh, 13th. So, you know. <laughs> um, hopefully this doesn't mean anything. Let's just let's just leave it at that. Um, as for the race, um, again, wasn't exactly a dramatic race, but we did see someone else win the race other than Scott McLaughlin for once. Fabian Coulthard with his first win of the season. Um, good job to him. Um, he pretty much ran the perfect race. He didn't do anything wrong. Um, the only reason he was ahead, though, is because Scott McLaughlin had an issue while traversing pit lane, which I didn't understand what it was at the time. Um, but I do have an article here that explains it. So, um, according to uh, Ryan's story... Um, the uh, managing director of DJ Art Penske. Um, the, he had an electrical issue with his pit lane speed limiter that meant that he was um, limited to a slower pace than, than the pit lane speed limit. So he was literally traversing speed... Uh, he was literally traversing pit lane slower than you meant to. Um, which is weird. Never seen that before. So a lot of weird electrical issues at DJR this weekend um it does explain why he came out behind because he was like one and a half seconds ahead of fabian went into pit earlier before him um fabian comes in the lap after he fabian puts on more fuel than scotty and fabian comes out ahead of him <laughs> so that was really weird um so i'm glad we got an explanation for that one um so first is fabian Coulthard, second was scott mclaughlin Third was Anton Di Pasquale with his first ever podium in supercars. Um, he's another one that I've got my eye on. He seems like a talented guy with just making last year. I think he was just played by rookie errors. Um, this year, I think the start of the season, he's been played by a car that hasn't been that great. Um, but I've been keeping my eye on him and I'm glad to see him get his first podium. I think that's the first of many. Um, in my opinion, I think he's definitely a strong driver and one to keep an eye on um, as the years kick, um, as the years come. 
So look out for him. Uh, Will Davison in fourth, forever in fourth. That's just where he is. Um, <laughs> he's a solid driver, but he just can't seem to get past that fourth position. I'd love to see him on the podium because he really does deserve one. He's such a hardworking driver. Uh, Chaz Moster in fifth and Cameron Waters in sixth. After pulling a bold strategy on Sunday, putting in like 20 litres of fuel at the first pit stop, whereas everybody else was putting in like 60. <laughs> so they were out well ahead on the first pit stop, but had to sit for ages during the second one. Um, Shane Van Gisbergen in 7th, Rick Kelly in 8th, uh, Tim Slade up 11 spots into ninth. great race for him, um, he had a great um, late comeback where they left him out quite long in the second stint, um, brought him in late and put on fresh tyres and he absolutely carved through the field, it was um, probably the best part to the race <laughs> to be honest, it was um, fascinating watching him try to get through the whole field, uh, Nick Perkett in 10th, David Reynolds in 11th, 11th in 11th up five spots jamie winkup in 12th not a fantastic race from him uh andre Heimgartner in 13th not the same performance that we saw on the previous day but still solid he didn't move any spots from qualifying uh lee holdsworth up four sports four spots i can't talk today in 14th scott pye in 15th todd hazelwood in 16th down eight spots um he was punched off the track very early on by james courtney um Unfortunately for him, it's unfortunate to see Todd Hazelwood like that. Um, but this is just what happens. Um, James um, locked up locked up the rear tires coming into um, that left hander after that that sharp right hander that I mentioned before. So the sharp there's a sharp right and then a, a slighter left. Um, it was at the start of the race. Um, the cars were all bunched up. Um, Courtney goes in deep hits the brakes too hard, locks up, runs into the back of Todd and just pushes him, just completely punts him off the track. Um, unfortunate for him, but he re- he had an excellent recovery considering he was in the gravel trap and didn't, he got, he was backwards in the gravel trap, didn't beach it. He got out of the gravel trap, kept going and managed to finish in 16th, which is a fantastic recovery. Um, so props to him for that. That would have been an epic drive. Uh, Mark Winterbottom in 17th. Simona up another five spots to 18th. Gary Jacobson in 19th. I'm pretty sure, once again, that he just lives in 20th or 19th. Uh, Jack LeBrock in 20th. Macaulay Jones in 21st. James Golding in 22nd. Richie Stanaway in 23rd because they were both double stacked on top of, which was weird. So they both came in. The first stop happens. The first set of pit stops and both cars come in at the same time. And they just stack behind each other. So... That was odd. <laughs> that was very, very odd. Um, I don't really know what happened there. Um, but uh, team miscommunication um, meant that both drivers thought that the other person was staying out. So they both came in and, you know, surprise, surprise. Uh, Richie Stanaway was the one that lost out. Um, I don't really know what happened to James Golding or why he ended up so far back, but that's what happened to Richie Stanaway. Um, and James Courtney in 24th, um, who was two laps down in the end um, after oh god he got penalised he got a 15 or 10 second time penalty for punting Todd Hazelwood off then his load bearing tyre that exploded on Saturday exploded twice on Sunday so that was really weird nothing happened to Scott Pye's car all weekend so I don't know if they just over put like too much pressure in that in that tyre or too much camber or something but it didn't work out well for him. It didn't work out well for him at all. Um, so that was Phillip Island. It wasn't the most dramatic race, especially the Sunday one wasn't super interesting. Um, but it did give us some uh, fantastic stories in Andre Heimgartner and Anton Di Pasquale getting their first solo podiums. Great job to them. Um, they're two drivers that I really do have my eye on. Um, I think they're going to make waves in this sport eventually maybe not right now but eventually i think no i think they'll get into good spots um and start start making moves i think um so keep your eye on them that's for sure um as for the championship who's leading the championship well you already know the answer to that it's scott mclaughlin with 1058 points followed by fabian coulthard in second 124 points down this means that he is Ooh. I think if Fabian comes in fourth and Scotty DNFs, he will tie him on points, I think. So that's how far ahead Scotty is at the moment. If if he he can DNF a whole race and probably still be ahead in points. Um, so, which is pretty much exactly what happened in Melbourne. 
Um, he's ridiculously far ahead at the moment. So hopefully uh, Coulthard can bring the fight to him uh, should DJR continue this um, impressive form. Hopefully Coulthard can bring the fight to him a bit more because I would like to see a battle for the championship, please. <laughs> I don't want to just see uh, McLaughlin run away with it. Um, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Chaz in third, uh, 243 points down. Um, so that's more than... Well, that's more than one ra- whole race win from the lead. Shane Van Gisbergen in fourth, 256 points down. David Reynolds in fifth. Uh, and Will Davison in sixth, who is 336 points down. So remember that 300 points is two race wins. So first to fifth, uh, one race win and a bit um, away from overtaking the lead. So the only person who could take the lead from Scotty should he DNF in one race is Fabian Coulthard um, and he'd have to finish in the top five uh, everybody else needs Scotty to DNF and then also needs him to have a couple of bad races in order for them to get ahead so he's got a healthy margin um, Nick Perkett in 7th and Tim Slade in 8th quite consistent from the BJR boys uh, Jamie Wincup with an awful season um, so far in ninth. with Mark Winterbottom in 10th he's doing great to be in 10th in the Team 18 car which last year we finished in what second last? Um, so he's doing great. That's a, they should be very happy with that. Cameron Waters in 11th. He really deserves to be higher, but there you go. Uh, Anton Di Pasquale in 12th with his recent points haul. James Courtney in 13th. Andre Heimgartner in 14th. Lee Holdsworth in 15th. Scott Pye in 16th. Rick Kelly in 17th. Todd Hazelwood in 18th. James Golding in 19th. Simona Di Silvestro in 20th. Richie Stanaway in 21st. Jack LeBrock in 22nd. Gary Jacobson in 23rd, Macaulay Jones in 24th, and wildcard entrant Jack Smith in 25th. Uh, as for uh, team points, obviously DJR is in first, um, followed by Red Bull in second, who are 25 points clear of BJR. <laughs> BJR are in a very, very close third to Red Bull very close um this is probably the strongest i've ever seen bjr in a, in a while so um good news for them um although it, a lot of it is a struggling red bull team let's be honest but they are ahead of tickford which have been stronger than than bjr as a whole so it's interesting to see that um yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, so Red Bull's 511 points down from D, uh, from DJR. Um, there's too many teams with J and R's in their names. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Red Bull's 511 points down. So as I said before, that's nearly three race wins. Um, obviously, that's two cars, so the, the numbers are always going to be bigger, but that's pretty far back. Um, followed by BJR in a very close third. And then followed by um, the Lee Holdsworth and Chaz Mostert parts of Tickford in fourth. And the reason why that number isn't higher is because if it was Will Davison and Chaz Mostert, they'd probably be in an easy second. Um, but that's not the case. Uh, Erebus in fifth. So the pretty much every spot from second to fifth, they're all very close. Um, less than 100 points separating them, um, which is... Good to see. There's some stiff competition going on there. Uh, Cameron Waters and Will Davison in sixth spot for Tickford. Um, Walkinshaw Andretti in seventh. Uh, Rick Kelly and Andre Heimgardner in eighth. Uh, Gary Rogers Motorsport in ninth. Simona and Gary Jacobson in tenth. Mark Winterbottom all by himself in eleventh. Todd Hazelwood in twelfth. Um... Jack LeBrock in 13th and Macaulay Jones, all by his lonesome, with 294 points to his name in 14th. And ridiculously, this is this is mental because there's just... <laughs> so I'm looking at the team's championship tables and the amount of... It shows the points, the differential between them, and it also shows how many penalty points they've got. And the amount of teams with penalty points this season is ridiculous. <laughs> there is... Four teams with zero penalty points. Four. <laughs> um, BJR and... Uh, so Bradley Jones Racing and Gary Rogers Motorsport are the only full teams to have no penalty points at all. 
Uh, the other two officially classed teams with no penalty points are the Lee Holdsworth and Chaz Mostert arm of Tickford Racing, which is obviously two of the four cars. The other two cars do have penalties. Our man Macaulay Jones, um, who is... Well, they're part of a three-car team. So all three cars uh, for Bradley, Bradley Jones Racing uh, don't have any penalty points, along with Gary Rogers. Um, everybody else... Everybody else has penalty points, at least 30. So uh, DJR and Red Bull both have 60. Erebus have 30. Cameron Waters and Will Davison have 30. Welcome Shaw and Jody have 30. Um, both Kelly Racing uh, teams, in inverted commas, have at least 30. Winterbottom has 30. Todd Hazelwood has 30. And Jack LeBrock has 30. Uh, Techno Racing. Um never seen so many penalty points before it's it's really weird um so yeah that was philip island um normally philip island is a very uh, very good um a good race um a little disappointing this year um a touch not super exciting um but that's okay not every race is going to be the best race in the world um so Instead of looking at Philip Island, now we look ahead to the next race. So what is the next race? Well, it's the Perth Barbagello round. Um, very short track. Um, this is definitely where knockout qualifying will be beneficial. Um, last year we saw um, we saw the uh, tire wear be um, be a huge huge factor uh, with many cars running long on the early stint and then just plowing their way through the field on fresher tires um shane van gisbergen in particular did that very well for red bull last year hopefully we see some more action like that again because that was some great racing we saw last year and to top it all off it's the perf super nights the super night event is back no longer at eastern creek now it's at perf which i think is a great choice because um well Perth is three hours behind us, so it means we still get the race at a decent time. Um, and it's also just, it's earlier in the year, so it's not as cold at night. Like, it was pretty bloody cold <laughs> last year at Eastern Creek. Um, and at Perth's a hotter place, so it's just, it's all around a good idea. Um, I'm a big fan of having the Super Night at Barbagello this year. Um, and it should be... Should be. I know I said this about Phillip Island, but it should be a good race just because the tie wear factor is so high. Uh, last year, we had some great racing. So hopefully this year, we see something similar. Um, Barbagello is on in two weeks? Three weeks? 15 days from now is practice one. So I guess, uh, yeah, three weeks. Um, which is ages. It's ages. How are we going to wait that long? Uh, we'll figure it out. Um... So three weeks from now, I will be back to uh, talk to you about the results from Barbagello Raceway at the Perth Super Night. But until then, I'll catch you later. Uh, make sure if you have any questions for me that you want me to answer, make sure you leave them in the comments below. Uh, leave a like, all that stuff. Um, and I will see you on the next episode of the V8 Supercars Fan cast my name has been kendall from bearded kendall i will see you later bye